statistics, when we draw a curve, sometimes we're doing area under a curve, which if you recall from calculus, that's called an integral, but we never even use the word integral in statistics. We almost always say the area under the curve. So that's the only situation you'd even consider having a thought about calculus. Other than that, all the rest of the formulas are going to be based on algebra. So like for instance, suppose I had five data values, and let's say these were scores out of 20 on a uh, multiple choice exam. One person got 17, another person got 16, another person got 19, another person got 18, another person got 18. In math, we often label these, so subscripts, and in math, we use a subscript just for labeling. Now, the reason I mentioned that to you is because suppose I wanted to add all these together. You know, I could, cer I could certainly say X1 plus X2 plus X3. But if you can imagine, suppose instead of five data points, I had 100 data points. That would be very cumbersome to write it out. So what we often do in math, we say, let's let it be X I. Now the I there just represents a counter. We're gonna let I range from one to five. And then we often use in statistics, this symbol, which I'd be surprised if you haven't seen yet. So by the way, in statistics, we often use, we use a lot of Roman letters, but we, often, we also use some Greek letters. So the capital Sigma is just a shorthand for sum of all the, in this case, the, all the subscripts. So notice that we're just gonna put in I equals one, I equals two, I equals three, I equals four, I equals five, because five is the top number and this is the starting number. Let's put it this way, even though in algebra, you know, you know how to hopefully label things in terms of subscripts, in statistics, we still do the same thing, but we just take another half step in terms of algebra, just to kind of make the formulas look a little more sophisticated. I mean, they're no different than just something as simple as adding, but it's just, it's just a shorthand. So you gotta be able to know that to be able to read statistics formulas. What I'm trying to say is that good statistics is built upon good algebra, but you also need good arithmetic. The thing that really ties these together is the computing. The reason I suggest that is because you're gonna take the algebra and the arithmetic and sort of make it specific and express it by using formulas. Here's the deal, why do people often say statistics is very real world? It turns out more than most types of math I've helped people with, I have found that statistics tends to not just go into STEM fields, but also into the social sciences. A lot of students I work with in statistics are like in psychology too, but they have to know how to read papers that are like such and such statistical study was done in terms of double blind on such and such patients and we gave these people the aspirin and we didn't give these people the aspirin and then here was you know the difference in their depression levels or whatever one thing that's unique about statistics class is anytime you first learn something you learn just the equation and just the concept but almost immediately you start applying it so just one thing that you definitely need to know is that statistics problems are often what we would call word problems in math, uh, requiring interpretation of the words into variables that we will use in the equations. So that's an important idea. There's a, one skill you build in statistics more than most math classes is you build your ability to kind of scan the words and then figure out, oh, this is X. Oh, this is N. One of the most obvious signs is to look for the number of inputs. This is important. So if they only give you, let's say, two given values, there's only certain equations you can use. But if they give you like a bunch of given information, you probably have to go through a longer calculation. I would also recommend when you think about the statistics, try to think about the units. As we will see in statistics, certain variables are intentionally unitless. We want them to be sort of general recipes that work for sort of any statistical situation. Suppose we go back to the test scores here. 
The test scores themselves, the X's would have units of like points. A lot of times when you take data, data itself does have units. So units versus no units is a little bit of a tip off and which variable. So let's talk about discrete versus what I'd like to call continuous data. And both of these, by the way, are numerical data. So let's go over the difference between these. Now let's suppose I go back to those students taking that exam. If it's a multiple choice exam, can the student ever get part of one question correct? So with dis discrete, we dealing with whole numbers, but let's think about continuous. Continuous, let's suppose I go back to the idea of the heights of people at my college. Can someone be 150.3 centimeters tall? Sure, there's no problem with that. They could be 150, 151, yeah. or they could be 150.3. Yeah. So you allow decimals. For example, like 18 questions correct. Whereas with continuous, it would be like 150.3 centimeters tall. Now, the reason that's important is because certain distributions and statistics are gonna be discrete. In other words, the distributions will be like this. You may have seen these kind of things already. Continuous distributions might be like this. Well, not so much random, but, but smooth. This right here is a distributed frequency, as is this, but this would be a discrete probability distribution. Now, the reason I bring this to your attention is because it turns out in statistics, we use decimals a lot more often than we use fractions. Some of our equations definitely are fractions, but we don't like a lot of times calculate, oh, this is like one eighth. A lot of times we'll convert that to 0 0.125. There's going to be a lot of answers that you'll get in statistics that the decimal sort of goes on forever and it's no pattern. So I recommend rounding to four decimal places. That seems to be some sort of a standard. Most of the time, if you're entering a homework problem in an online format or whatever, where it's gonna automatically check the answer, usually it'll specify how many decimal places. Another thing I should briefly say about statistics is sometimes we use the calculator or Excel very extensively. So again, we have to be careful about the units and be careful about the input variables. But here's the deal, in a lot of cases, you and I will sort of calculate something in Excel, but once we calculate that in Excel, we'll already sort of have like built sort of like a mini calculator so that you can basically take that same recipe of equations and stuff and then just plug in a different set of numbers and then the answer just pops out immediately. In other words, we're building our own little algorithms. Basically, we just change the input and then the algorithm takes care of calculating it for us the next time around. Sure. So let's get into this idea of mean, uh, variance, covariance, coefficient of variation, correlation coefficient. So mean is often associated with other words, mean or medi median or mode. So these are often spoken of together. I just pulled this somewhat randomly from the web, but this is census data from the United States Census Bureau about how much money people tend to make. Now think about this. Let's define where first the mean is. The mean is gonna be the average, but the average, think about it, is gonna be, there's people way out here that make a ton of money. Most people are in here, but what this also indicates is that the mean is gonna be somewhere in here. Now think about this, even though the greatest number of people, at least in a particular income bracket, are over here, there's people over here that are sort of pulling on the mean. Notice this is important, the median, people often talk about the median income. The median income is right here, do you see that? this number right there, it's right at the 50th. Sometimes it's called the yeah. 50th percentile. 50% 50 of the people make less than $53,700 US per year. 50% of the people make, well, more than that, right? So it's the middle number, like literally, like if you lined up all the people in the United States, like in a row, the middle person makes $53,700. But now let's take a look at the mode. Interestingly enough, the mode 
that would be right here. So the most common is gonna be, I don't know, maybe 40,000. But what I'm trying to say is that this distribution is not normally distributed. We often call this skewed. skewed. So it's got a really long tail. So we would call this right skewed. Skewed is not symmetric. As a point of comparison, the bell curve would be symmetric and it's not skewed. The reason I bring this to your attention and why this is really important is because mean, median, and mode are all sometimes called the most common statistics calculated for central tendency. Central tendency just means the middle. Like how do you define the middle of the data set? By far, the mean is the most common statistic or number we're gonna use in statistics, but median and mode are sometimes used as well. And there's reasons for that. If somebody was to ask me why study statistics, in short, here's how I would answer. Summarizing data to make decisions. That's the idea of statistics, right? We're summarizing a bunch of data to make informed decisions. Now, of course, when we first get started, one of the first questions somebody's gonna ask you is, okay, you have this data set, what's the middle of it? If a politician wanted to know, hey, what are we gonna do about the income inequality in the United States? One of the first things people do is they first start talking about the mean and the median and the mode. They start talking about those because that at least gives some characterization of a lot of people with just one to three numbers. So anyway, the, the reason I bring all this to your attention is because one of the first things we want to know in statistics is how to summarize data. And one of the first questions we ask is what is the middle? So the next thing we need to talk about though is these ideas though. So the first one is variance. So think of variance as the spread. I'd like to point one thing out in terms of the normal distribution or for that matter, something that's symmetric and then draw another contrast. With a normal distribution, the mean and the median and the mode are all what? The same place, right in the middle. So that's very convenient. Now, by the way, you've already mentioned the normal distribution before in the bell curve. That's by far the most common distribution we do study in statistics class. Because if you think about it, most things in this world occur near the middle. Think about, like I mentioned before, like the heights of people at your college. You know, most people are near the average, near the middle. Right, but there's a few people over here that are tall, there's a few people over here that are short, Absolutely. and everywhere in between. But there's less people that are more tall, but there's even less people that are taller. So, it's, so it yeah. spreads yeah. out in a nice bell curve. So anyway, the reason I even mention that is because just, just know the normal distribution, the bell curve, we're gonna study that a lot in statistics. But in contrast, let's suppose I have two normal distributions. And both of those normal distributions have different amounts of spread. In other words, they have different amounts of their variance. This right here, it, do, you know what, do you know what this Greek letter is called, by the way? So it's gonna be called lowercase sigma, and it's for the population standard deviation, which is gonna be a very important thing we're gonna use throughout the semester. And by the way, standard deviation is a lot to write out. It's often abbreviated STDDEV. Variance is going to be sigma squared. So think about this. If sigma is small, then this is small variance. If sigma is large, then there's gonna be larger variance. Let's just suppose red represents the test scores of like a a one room schoolhouse, let's say somewhere in the Midwest of the United States. They all have the same teacher, they all learn the same, they're all about the same. So most of the students are gonna score in the middle on their standardized test. Now let's suppose instead, by contrast, we have a really large big city school, let's just say in New York City or something in the United States. You're gonna, you're gonna have some students that the parents are paying for tutoring and study all the time, they're gonna be way over here. But there's gonna be yeah. some students that you're falling way behind, they're over there. So you're gonna have a much larger spread. Now, even though the average between the two schools should be approximately the same, because after all, if it's a standardized test across the United States, 
they score average about the same. There's a lot more spread. There's a lot more variance in the big city school as opposed to the, let's say the, the Midwest school. That's a key idea because in statistics, when we first start learning, we pretty much always have either one data set or we have summary statistics of one data set. Later in the semester, as we get more sophisticated, we start intercomparing data sets. Now, later in the semester, we start doing the differences between the means of the two data sets. But guess what? Okay. You can also compare the differences in variance of the two different data sets. And by the way, you know, that gets into analysis yeah, of variance. So when we do analysis of variance, what we're going to assume is we're going to assume something like, are things different or are they not? Is the question we ask with analysis of variance. When we say different, we mean different amounts of variance, whereas are they the same? There's not much variance amongst them. An example that comes to mind, let's say we go to five different casinos in Las Vegas, Nevada, in the US. If you go to, let's say one casino, let's say they pay out a lot of money, but they don't pay much in certain situations. But let's say another casino, if you win, they always pay the same amount. So that would be differences in their variance. Now, some of those things are controlled by law, but my point is that you'd be interested to investigate those kind of things if you were checking to make sure all those casinos were operating legally. Does one pay a lot more and then a lot less versus another one pays almost the exact same payout for every, let's say, slot machine or something?